So, so welcome to Reconceptualizing the Future of Partnerships. This is the fourth webinar in the Branch Ed Nuts and Bolts series. Um, I'm Aubrey Evans. I'm the Director of Professional Learning at Branch Ed. We are going to get started um, quickly. I know everyone is eager to hear from our expert panelists, and we are so honored that you are all here with us today. Uh, I want to share, briefly share the mission of Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity. It is our vision to strengthen, grow, and lift up the impact of educator preparation programs, or EPPs, at minority-serving institutions, or MSIs, as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representation of teachers of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure America's children receive the best education and support as possible. Um, so first a bit about this webinar series. Today, of course, is reconceptualizing the future of partnerships. Last month, we had a webinar on assessment, and this is the last webinar in this series. And at the end of today, I will show our fall series that will be coming up. Um, so this series came about because we recognize that we have an opportunity and a responsibility to take what we have learned from COVID about serving all students inclusively and equitably and using it to inform the future. And not just adding on to what already exists, but what we want is transformation. And I'm guessing that you're all here because you want transformation too. So today is an opportunity for us to come together as a community and I, I know that I'm sharing screen, but I want to invite everyone to take a look at the other Zoom squares. This is your community. The people in these Zoom squares are from EPPs and districts from MSIs and their communities across the US. You share with the others in the Zoom boxes unique goals and values for educating future teachers. And our goal for this event is to inspire and motivate each other so that everyone leaves with the energy to make the change that we can within our sphere of influence. So today, as I've said, is reconceptualizing the future of partnerships. Today's panel makes up um, a university president, a college of education dean, and a superintendent. These are all key roles in effective partnerships. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you know that you have options about the way you view today's webinar. In the upper right hand corner, you can choose speaker view or gallery view. So I will now hand it over to one of Branch Ed's amazing continuous improvement coaches, Dr. Amy Murillo, who will introduce you to our speakers and tell you a bit more about today's session. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. I'm going to just give a brief introduction to our panelists, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the conversation. Uh, so for uh, to start with, we have Dr. Carl Shapiris. Dr. Shapiris serves as the Dean of the College of Education and Human Development at Texas A&M University at San Antonio. Uh, Dr. Shapiris has extensive experience in pediatric and family mental health and has served various other roles in higher education over the years. Next, we have also with us Dr. Teniente Matson. Uh, Dr. Matson is the president of Texas A&M University at San Antonio and is a San Antonio native with over 30 years of higher education experience uh, in Alaska, California, and of course, Texas. And then last but not least, uh, we welcome Dr. Eduardo Hernandez, uh, who joined Edgewood ISD family as the superintendent of schools in June of 2018. Um, during his more than 19 years of service and education, Dr. Hernandez has established a reputation of being a focused and strategic educational leader. Welcome to our three panelists today. Thank you for spending time with us uh, and sharing some of your insights. We're going to get started right away with the conversation. Just as a reminder to our participants, if you have a question that you'd like to ask of the panelists or you would like them to expound on something that you heard, go ahead and use that chat box and um, Aubrey will be uh, monitoring that and we'll check in uh, through, during the session or at the end uh, and save some time for participant questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Today we are talking about partnerships what it means for a college of education to have a strong relationship with their K-12 partner, and also how we might reimagine these partnerships to truly transform and imagine teacher education for the benefit of all. So I'm going to start with a question about the power of partnerships, but also ask our panelists to provide some of the context of their own partnership that they share. 
Uh, so the first question, I'm going to start with Dr. Shapiris, and he might hand it off to someone else. Uh, but the first question is, um, can you provide some brief context about your partnership and then tell us a little bit about what the pandemic revealed about the power of partnerships in that context? Sure. Thank, thank you for the question. And I'm really happy to be here and to talk about partnerships, especially uh, with Dr. Matson, who has been really brilliant in moving to uh, look at ways that we collaborate across our, our South San Antonio region, um, South Bear County, Texas. And uh, just pleased to work with Dr. Ed Hernandez and looking at his district and creating a, a district of innovation that really makes a difference to a community that has long had inequities evident um, across the population. So, um, we came together as part of um, Dr. Matson's vision was to create a collaborative of uh, school districts that serve South Bear County in, in Texas. Uh, when you look at uh, Highway 90, which goes through San Antonio, the, uh, there's a clear divide in terms of uh, equitable education, equitable access to resources, uh, that just cuts across the, the communities. And uh, one of the things we see is that the average uh, income of families is about 24,000 for a family of four. And uh, Dr. Hernandez's district is one of the poorest, if not uh, the, the poorest in the state. Um, and uh, so he came in knowing that uh, and came with a, a vision for change and a vision for um, leveraging the resilience and the grit of the community to make a, a difference in the educational system. So we've put together this partnership where we are working uh, in conjunction with Dr. Hernandez to uh, not only look at issues across the district and how we work together to, to raise equity, but also actually in the operation of some of the schools. So we've uh, started in-district charter schools with uh, Dr. Hernandez's district um, that we operate through our institute here at AM San Antonio. Um, and we've expanded those uh, for the coming year. And they've just been really an incredible opportunity for us to be in the community engaged in a way that is, I think, different than what we see across most uh, educational institutions. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Dr. Matson. did you wanna add on maybe and talk a little bit about anything that was revealed uh, during the pandemic about the power of this partnership? I, I think I'll, I'll back up for a moment if you, if you don't sure. mind. Um, you know, Carl gave, I think a, a good, a great summary of the partnership, but I think one of the leadership lessons that we all need to learn is really how to pivot uh, when you find yourself confronting a situation that you may not have expected. And, and Dr. Hernandez, I think, was part of this original discussion that um, my, uh, my vision, my idea in coming together with, this, with the seven school districts was actually a course correction from an earlier idea I had had. And that was to create a lab school, as, as Carl was describing, these in-district charters, which I think are the ultimate goal for what we're trying to do if we think about a long fuse um, to really change the trajectory. But it really started with a and San Antonio exploring the idea of an actual charter school on our campus. And when I went to the superintendents, um, the Dr. Hernandez is one of them, we have a, a network here in South Bear County that I did not create, they created it on their own of South Bear County superintendents and presented this, what I thought was a brilliant idea of having a charter school located on our campus. The charter entity was willing to build the school. It was being done to become the teacher laboratory. And it was um, met with resounding resistance. And the, the lesson I learned from that in my dialogue with the superintendents opened up a much richer conversation about the fact that something we already knew but really weren't leaning into. And that is that AM San Antonio really is one of the anchor partners. And to turn away from the school districts instead of into the school districts was a huge mistake. 
And it was something that caused me to go back and reconcile with what we were trying to do at the university, which was all about serving teachers and serving the districts and serving the needs of the community in a different way. And that really caused us to look outward at how do we take these models into the schools also prompted me to go out with our provost, of course, and look for somebody like Carl, um, someone that could come and make bring these partnerships and this, this vision to life. And by doing that, we have really embraced a much broader group of very talented superintendents and very talented thought leaders and gone into a direction that was very non-traditional from what we were originally thinking. And I can tell you, for those of you who are Texas superintendents or Texas partners, there's a reason that not a lot of uh, other institutions, and we're the only ones in Texas, a public university doing this, and certainly with seven school districts, is that it's very hard to do. And so you have to not only have the big idea out there, but the leadership of a dean like um, of education like we have in Carl, and the, the really, the faith, the commitment to the partnership that we have from the superintendents. This is one of my highest priorities of my entire university of agenda across everything else we do is to make sure that this Aspire network works. And so that big idea in the leadership has to come up, down and across and be willing to, to have this be your wake up every morning and go to bed every night, something that you're thinking about in order to really change the trajectory. And that's how I see uh, the brilliance of not only our partnership, but the team that's part of it and, uh, and what it takes to keep it moving forward. I would turn to, to Ed because he, he's one of our, our, you know, our, our most valuable partners in this. And I think he was there with me when we reimagined what this was going to look like in what we have now in the Aspire Network. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Matson and Dr. Hernandez. I do want you to weigh in here. One about you know, uh, you know, building on what Dr. Matson was saying about the power of this uh, um, relationship with the the partners, but also maybe touch on uh, as we had discussed previously as we were preparing, you know, this bureaucracy that sometimes exists in institutions that you need to wade through to make some of these reimaginings uh, of schools and partnerships happen. And so you can talk about the power of that partnership, uh, how it came about, and then how you waded through maybe some of those bureaucracies that tend to overwhelm our institutions when we want to make significant changes or re-envisionings of how we do our work. Sorry, I had this on mute. All right, so I think one of the first things that we also have to discuss is, I want to add to, I want to start with first what Carl mentioned um, about other contexts that created a perfect storm for someone like me who came in to, the, the greater context is San Antonio. I'm, I'm not from San Antonio. I'm actually from North Texas. And so when I came in, barring the research that I did on um, the history of the district, which is, uh, as Dr. Shapiris mentioned, yeah, I knew what I was coming into when I interviewed for the district. I, but I, I looked at it as an opportunity to rebrand a district that, quite frankly, um, had lost trust both within the district in terms of its community, but also on the external people who were dealing with the district. The other part of this perfect storm was the fact that the Texas Education Agency was in the middle of monitoring the district. It had controlled it. It was in the middle of a takeover of the district. So those into seven elected individuals that were in the district were asked to step aside and there was a board of managers that was brought in. That board of managers was the one that hired me. And so when they brought me in, one of my first uh, honest conversations with them was that we would need to talk about every elephant that was in the room before we took any initiative. And that elephant started with the fact that we had a branding issue, we had a trust issue, which had to be addressed first. And in doing those things, that means that we had to go out again and find leaders in the community that were ready to pivot, had great context in terms of the city, but also were willing and courageous to go out and change things. So this is where I meet Dr. Manson, who I knew was trying to uh, reimagine something for the districts in the, in the South, or the Southwest, Southeast. Uh, and there was this network of superintendents that I was coming into to meet, the seven. Uh, and so there was the first opportunity about bringing in the, the branding of a university like Texas a and San Antonio and what that brings with it. And then asking quite frankly to say, hey, look, let's look at this as when nothing different than when two doctors bring in a third doctor for an opinion and 
How do we, we have this, this patient that's sick, if you will. So that's what Edgewood was. How do we rehabilitate this patient? How do we start over again? And how do we do it in a way that for now, I'm going to need to count on the branding and the, and the respect that you've earned. I'm asking for a handout, if you will. I'm also asking for the expertise that you bring with professors in the university. And Im imagining a school, we have two schools, Gus Garcia University uh, Middle School, and now we're going to have the, uh, one of our intermediate schools where you actually have professors on campus. And what does that do in terms of imaging for a community who, quite frankly, um, Dr. Shapiro used the, the, uh, the example of Highway 90 is a dividing uh, a place here in Edgewood. Anything south of that is, for us, is one of the places in, in the city that have been forgotten. And so if I'm a parent and I'm walking around and I see this, this branding like Texas A&M San Antonio that is in the school, and I know that's a university, and I think of the prestige of just the Texas A&M system, and I'm gonna now engage with, the, with, with that superintendent, with that school district, and try to build trust again. So that was a perfect storm for us to start with opportunities that the state had created through Senate Bill 1882 partnerships such as these. Um, and for quite frankly, for a first time superintendent, I thought, okay, obviously what was done in the past wasn't working. I've always been very gutsy with things that I do and I, and I have a lot of respect for Dr. Manson. I thought, let's, let's engage in this partnership. Let's learn about how we can leverage all of their expertise and how do we take the expertise that we have we have expertise we're just growing along with this partnership and so these things came into into play for us as we started this conversation and here we are two or three years later we now have two three schools the Burleson School of, In of Innovation is also another one of our campuses that we partner with uh, Texas A&M and and, and um, I, I tell you this is one of the best decisions that we made and I thank both individuals on this panel because they also too I know Carl has a personal stake in why you know, uh, we started with Burleson. And, and I know that was purposeful work. I call it heart work. It all starts from a place. So for me, it started because I'm a, I'm a kid, first generation kid who came out of poverty. And so I, it's very personal for me, the work we do. And then when you have a courageous leader like Dr. Manson, regardless of, we yes, there's a lot of politics and bureaucracies and I'm sure she has hers just like I have mine. But if we're committed to working and really changing the lives of our scholars, and these type of partnerships are what we have to engage in. And I would add that the superintendent and the dean have been just stellar leaders, block walking together. Uh, I didn't mention that he led platicas, you know, this round tables in the community where he and the dean and others within the university were really listening and engaging families. And, and when you do things like that, you're taking the most affirmative lens possible. And I agree with what Ed also said about the university branding. You know, I love what I call the Gus Garcia School, the Gus, you know, Carl, Carl branded it. And we took the G for Gus Garcia, the U for university and the S for school. So the Gus University School uh, makes a lot of sense. And if you're a parent in there and maybe you don't speak English uh, in that school district, you may not know what Texas A&M University San Antonio is all about, but you know, Texas A&M University system equals good. Yes. And that's those are the brand equity relationships that Eduardo was talking about. I've been to those schools. I've met with those children. I've met the teachers. I've met the, the families. Uh, it, it's amazing. And we, we all take the most affirmative lens possible. And I know that we're changing lives. And that's something else that it brings the power of the university, the power of the college, the power of the students. And Carl has implemented, you know, a laundry list of really innovative programs that he'll talk more about. Um, but but you can see it in the eyes and, and the, of the families that are there and the faith that Ed has in building this as we go forward. And just just to add from a practical standpoint, so you know, we've been talking from a you know a higher level overview, but there there's some real practical things as you go back to the question about COVID and what we've learned and uh, with with our 1882 partnerships, we've got. Uh, a full-time faculty member at each of these schools. Uh, but okay, that, that, that's great to have a university faculty member. What's more important to say is we've got uh, over 40 faculty members from the university that have been involved in the working of these schools. Uh, 
So it's not just one person. There's one person there every day, but we've had 40 different faculty members from the College of Education that have been involved on a regular basis um, from writing grants to um, professional development for the teachers to um, being out there and doing service activities for the students. Uh, we had such a huge turnout for the, the Burleson Center when they did their fiesta and just going through and, and being a part of the community. It's really about engagement and, and true partnership, reciprocal, meaningful partnership. So as, as we've developed this model, it's brought together a synergy of things. One of the things we all know that happened in COVID-19 is that um, student access to internet was a huge issue. Uh, we knew it before, uh, but this really highlighted what was going on. And so Edgewood and Texas A&M and the city of San Antonio and Methodist Healthcare Ministries and city education partners all came together and, and looked at how do we address this issue. Uh, the city of San Antonio uh, dedicated $27 million to a project to build out infrastructure for the digital divide. AM San Antonio is the uh, head of all the research and impact evaluation for the city and the county on the digital divide. And so, because we have Gus Garcia as one of our charter schools, we were able to help guide the city toward implementing the infrastructure as the pilot through Edgewood as part of the process. So, we were able to help do that. In addition, we reached out in the community to Goodwill, um, who has a grant for digital literacy training. And we, we developed a partnership with them and said, well, what, you know, we're over here in, in these neighborhoods in Edgewood. Why don't you do the digital lit literacy training in the areas where we're building out the infrastructure? And they were uh, really excited about that opportunity. So now they're a part of our larger project, pulling their grant funds into it. And so now the parents can go through digital literacy training in the, in the neighborhoods and they get a computer if they end up uh, receiving, completing the uh, digital literacy training. And the other part we're building out now is a help desk support system for the, all of the teacher, staff, students um, that are tied into the Edgewood community. So we're building um, out our help desk at Texas A&M to support the help desk services and IT services at Edgewood. So this isn't just about educator preparation. The partnership is, is really involved and reciprocal and meaningful. Um, we spend a lot of time together in planning. I would, I, I would say to any superintendent that's possibly out there listening to this, the other part, we always want for more intellectual capital in the district. These types of partnerships allow you to access outside individuals who have expertise in other areas. I think, I think I, I consider leadership an opportunity that if you are vulnerable and courageous enough to admit that there are things that you just don't know what you don't know, but if you model that partnerships like these can bring you assistance, I, I'll speak directly to the partnership with Methodists. As a, as a career educator, there are things that I quite frankly just am not gonna know about technology. I don't know what I don't know, but when I have a partnership like this and someone looking out for us like Dr. Manson, because that was said, Dr. Madison, you've never even heard me say this four times that because of her looking out for our district and her getting us um, uh, legal help, pro bono help, and, and we are, we're afforded an opportunity not to lose out on something for, this, for the sheer, just simple reason that we don't know what we don't know sometimes. I think that allows the superintendent to garner outside help that ultimately affects the classroom and ultimately affects whether we're in a pandemic or not that you have a disenfranchised group of individuals who don't have access to the internet. And that is the next, I mean, that's a, that's a social justice issue now. And so, you know, I think that's important in these partnerships allow men and women like me who serve children to acquire these outside resources. Amy, I would add um, that at the beginning of the partnership, or maybe it was maybe six months into it or so, a few, few months into the partnership, the university did commission a study um, to look at, so one of the things that, that Ed is referring to and Carl has dealt with this too, is that a lot of this data is disaggregated everywhere. And so the university um, put, its, put dollars towards commissioning a study, I think it cost us 50,000 bucks or so, to actually paint a picture of what, what is the state of South Bear County. And we must have looked at 30 or 40 variables 
Um, and so we, we paid a firm to pull all the data together to help us tell this narrative and this story, which has also, we shared with the superintendents. They can obviously see their column, their data, but what we're really focused on, and you're hearing it from Carl and Ed, Eduardo, is the collective impact. And the university can help drive that collective impact when we're looking out for the, the bigger picture. So we're talking today about Edgewood, but we try to bring opportunities. When I'm talking to the city mayor or the county judge or the TEA, I speak with the commissioner as well. I am speaking on behalf of our districts and I, I will bring it up to them that this district or that district or the Aspire Network, we need help in these areas. Are you aware? And where we can make those connections, we do. And people like Carl and Eduardo who actually then put those things into action uh, so when we're all focused on collective impact and moving the needle for all students, it's actually really helped us a lot in curriculum development, in new program development, in, in grants and other, you know, Carl's just talking about the tip of the iceberg with the city. I hope you, you know, into the conversation, we could talk a little bit more about digital equity, but we, all of our arrows are pointing in the same direction. If it's not good for all of our schools and, and the kids, then it's not good for the university. And that's really what we're looking at when we look for, look out for the superintendents and the districts themselves. I want to pull it back to educator preparation for a second. Um, and one of the things that we started prior to the pandemic was to build out teacher residencies um, and having students looking at year long clinical placements in, in the district. Uh, that's not a new idea. It's been, you know, talked about for 20 or 30 years. Uh, the question is, how do you do it and make it viable for a student? Um, in the case of our students, especially the, the ones in, that are from South San Antonio, we're first generation college students, uh, over 70% of our students, over 70% Hispanic, um, and most of them come from high need families. And so for them to be able to um, take on a year of teaching without pay is something that is impossible. So we've been looking at how do we do a paid year-long teacher residency, which we've been able to move forward with at, in Edgewood because of the SB 1882 partnerships. So we're able to find ways creatively to put in, in place uh, funded positions that's great for our students, but the idea here is for them to immerse in Edgewood and to become part of the Edgewood family so that they become hired teachers in Edgewood after they complete their residency. This is all about not just um, you know, benefiting the students, it's about the teacher pipeline and making sure that we have teacher retention in Edgewood after those students graduate. So having the university immersed in the district with the, the charter schools has a wraparound approach to all of our students going through that process. And now we're seeing the federal government, of course, catch up um, to the residency model and they're pushing that, that down through the states. And just last week, we found out that we're one of 15 universities in the state that have, a, that have been approved as a vetted teacher residency program, which means we're now eligible for state funding um, for, for that's coming down through the infrastructure dollars to uh, uh, pay for our, our students to get $25,000 a year to do year long teacher residencies. What we're talking about with the district is conditions for the students to accept that funding. And those conditions to me have to be that you're willing to commit um, to that district with a right of first refusal and that they have a, a time frame that they're going to stay in the district as a result of it. Because what happens is we have very affluent districts that are uh, in the north part of the city. And our best students get recruited by those districts and get pulled out of these high need areas and what we have to do is work together with the district and make it an effort so that these students early on in their career, not just look at Edgewood as an option, but Edgewood as a desire. And that that's the place they wanna be, that's the place they wanna stay, that's where their family is. And that's the equity equation. Yes, um, thank you. Oh my gosh, so, so much, uh, the great things that you guys are doing. And a lot of you pivoted to some of the things that I know that we wanted to talk about.
out and I can't see everyone online, but I can just imagine everyone like scribbling some notes of, of what they might want to, to try out uh, in, in their, uh, within their partnership. Um, I wanted to, I love how you guys underscored this idea of the partnership, not just university and district, but the par partnership is really those two entities, but the whole community, the students, the parents, the families that live uh, within the community that they serve. Um, and then what Dr. Shapiro was saying about those um, teacher candidates, uh, making sure that they feel a part of that family so that they have um, not just incentive to stay, but a desire to stay and work uh, with those families and with those students um, in, in, the, in the South Antonio area. Um, what, um, I'm just, you know, pulling out this question uh, for anyone who might want to add on to that. What does that look like from the teacher candidate experience? Uh, what type of program might they go through that would um, not just incentivize them, but also make them feel part of the community? What type of um, you know, classes are, might they be taking or engaging with, in, with their instructors? How might they be involved in the community outside of just the school? I don't know if you had anything that you wanted to add to, uh, to that topic uh, before we move to maybe some future looking ideas. Um, so one of the things I want to point out about a and San Antonio is that part of our mission is community engagement, right? That's, that's one of the focus points. And we're actually working right now, I'm co-chairing the uh, committee to establish us as a Carnegie community engagement institution. And so when we bring on faculty and staff, part of our interview process is to talk about how are you committed to working in the districts getting your hands dirty, not just working in the ivory tower and doing your research, but making a difference in the community. Um, and we value that. We value that in our evaluation process. We value that in the, the tenure and promotion process. Um, it's, it's part of who we are. And uh, so one of the things that we see is that the, the teachers, the professors that come in love to be out there and working with professional development and, and just that's part of the joy of their day um, to be involved with the school districts to advance the, that mission. Um, you know, when I brought it to my faculty about engaging in these uh, 1882 endeavors um, and taking on charter schools, not just one, but multiple charter schools, uh, the you would expect there to be some resistance. Instead, there was a resounding when can we start? When do we have access to the building? When can we get out there and work with the teachers? Um, and just such an excitement around this process. So it, it, I think that it's an innate thing that really just lives in the heart of all of our, our faculty and staff here. And I see it in the district. When we went out to talk to Gus Garcia teachers and we said, um, we're here to talk about the potential for a partnership and to, for us to be a charter school operator. Uh, we want to open up the conversation about any concerns you have, about any um, potential drawbacks you might see to it. We had 100% affirmation from the teachers in that meeting that they wanted the partnership. They wanted us to be involved in the community. Um, it was just a, such a, a heartfelt and joyous meeting that really, it. it it's just an amazing thing because you don't usually see that type of uh, cooperation. I'll add to that part of the conversation that that core value that Dr. Shapiro just mentioned about serving the community. I think it was one that uh, existed in Edgewood. Edgewood has a history of social justice realities that have happened in its history from the 68 walkout to the 89 case against uh, equity and finance. Um, there's always been a spirit of serving the West side, the near West side serving the community. We may have a little, but we'll share that little among us. And so I think that was there, but I think coming in, um, Dr. Manson mentioned, you know, the walking out into the neighborhoods, that's something that's very personal to me too. And so I think in the very beginning, there's the honest conversation around, here's where we are. Let's talk about all the elephants in the room. Let's talk about the fact that we're gonna have to do something different that will make it very uncomfortable. And it is okay to step out and say, this is not for me but it is not okay to stay in the same place. We will not stay in the same place, but I'll go first as the superintendent. I'll take that first risk. These 1882 partnerships can easily turn into a political nightmare for a superintendent because, you know, Carl used the example that teachers were, were, were elated. There was a lot of conversations before that in terms of doing something different, 
and doing it because our purpose is what's calling us to do this change. It is, what we're doing is not helping children. We're losing generations of children. And so if we're really here and we're driven by our purpose and heart, then we've got to do something different. And so that walking the neighborhoods, even helping people who need the help and don't accept it. You know, I'll be transparent with you. The first time I asked Carl to join us at a, at a platica in the neighborhood, you, he was there when I had a group of parents, moms specifically, who were not happy with what I, what I was bringing. And it turned into a very strong, I'm, I'm using that word very loosely, conversation in front of even two of my board members. But one thing we had to do was have these conversations out in the open. The good, the bad, the, even the pushback. Now, two years later, we, that, that school for our leadership school for boys has an 1882 partnership with a different operating partner. That group of moms, after you explain and you think about what's best for the collective uh, Edgewood versus just one school that was doing okay, people can get around an idea like that. So back to the concept of collective impact. Collective impact comes in the district when we can really speak to a purpose that we've now rallied people around. And then you take things like branding we talked about. And men and women like both the university president and the dean, well, this is very personal to them. So for me, yes, I will always remember who brought you, as Dr. Manson, who brought you to the dance. I will remember because for me, it was about corazón. We call it corazón, heart. There's a lot of heart in these two individuals. And so I see that. And for a district like the one that I have the honor of serving, we need more alliances like that. And so I want to add that to that part of the conversation too. Uh, and what, what you were saying, Dr. Hernandez, uh, with that platica in, in particular, um, you've got a proud community, mm -hmm. right? And there's been schools that have been immersed in that community for, for a very long time. And any change is difficult for a community, right? And so if you saw um, the master plan that Dr. Hernandez had laid out with all of the different schools and the changes, of course, that's, that's difficult for a community to absorb. But those kind of conversations and looking at how do you advance different academies and advance STEM and advance um, really high quality education across the district. Um, he's a master at, at getting people to understand it. And, and that was really great to watch him do that with that community because they were wanting to latch on to the way things have always been. And uh, as he walked through that process, he's been able to really get the, the community engaged in understanding that and it's just a, a master class in in community engagement and making sure that the community is involved in the decision making process thank you all um I, dr Matz, I didn't have a, a chance i don't know if she wanted to add something but i'm going to go ahead and start off my next question with her and if she wants to add something to what uh, her her um colleagues were, were, were discussing as uh, she can. So my next question uh, is really forward looking. I mean, again, so many great things uh, going on um, in, in San Antonio um, and lots of discussions nationally about what it means to, uh, for, for teacher education to have uh, different types of partnerships uh, with uh, districts and colleges of education. Uh, so uh, like I said, my next question is about the future. So what future do you envision for your partnership uh, or partnerships between colleges of education and school districts nationwide? You know, what's on the horizon? Uh, where do you go from here? Um, how will we move beyond this traditional thinking of K-12 and college of education uh, just being, you know, kind of like a placement partnership where we place student teachers? Uh, so Dr. Matson, I'm gonna start with what's the future? Well, I think we're at a really opportune moment in our nation's history with the federal administration that we have. And I don't, I'm not talking about politically, whether you're Democrat or Republican, it really doesn't matter. We're really talking about the view that our current federal administration has on teacher education. And at no time in our recent history have we had that much emphasis, compassion, interest, understanding, uh, basic fundamental understanding of, of equity and inequities that have existed across our country. So I see this moment now as a time for a lot of policy change, a lot of systemic change, and really an opportunity for uh, the federal government as well as universities to reimagine what that teacher education will look like. 
my hope is that we're going to see a greater emphasis on this, these partnerships that we've been talking about uh, and that the federal government and our, our crediting standards and such will enable these types of out of the box thinking that is occurring uh, with, with all levels. And I think Carl will come back to later, you know, introducing students earlier into the teaching profession. I think now also there is a deeper understanding of the vertical integration that, it, that can occur at, you can pick any level, I'm just going to pick middle school. You know, middle school introducing students to the idea of being teachers, um, high school, uh, what does that course curriculum look like? What does that pathway look like? Where is the curriculum alignment? Even if it's just one course, uh, what does that look like in the early college high school model so that they're more prepared and coming into um, either community college or four-year college like ours, four-year university like ours, are ready to go into that higher ed space. I think the other thing we can hope for is one of the examples that, that Carl was providing earlier about a recruiting that best talent in the high school level and incentivizing them. That when you're coming from a low income first generation family, it doesn't matter that the superintendent is going to give you a signing bonus in four years or five years, however long it takes to get through college, because you can't imagine getting past the first semester, nonetheless, the second semester to the third semester. So we need to identify those students earlier, in my view, and put that wraparound support service of both of the, both the superintendent and the dean we're talking about so that that student, when they come from an, an Edgewood ISD high school, knows that with satisfactory work and all of the wraparound support, they're guaranteed a job at Edgewood ISD when they come out of a college degree. That is one of the policy shifts that I hope we will find that enables those students to be identified earlier and move through a pipeline with you know, creative um, financial aid and, and structuring that gets them back into the districts that they want to be in. There's many other things I think we're going to see in terms of the curriculum itself. And Carl can talk more about that in terms of what we see in the future. But I, I think we're all going to be cybersecurity specialists in some way, shape or form, no matter what discipline you're in. And I think we've learned a lot about instructional design that's going to change this hybrid um, modality and mentality about how we engage students in student learning and family learning at that matter. Um, I was in a school, it wasn't an Edgewood school, it was in a Harlandale school, talking to a teacher well, a few months ago, maybe in May, and she told me she is now meeting with families at 11 o'clock at night, uh, that because, through the virtual connection that her day is now expanded and now that some parents have learned how to, to connect virtually, that they're re-engaging with the teacher when they're available, not necessarily during traditional office hours. And so obviously this goes to the dedication of that particular teacher, but I, I think we can see this the teacher profession and our access options back to the parental unit or care, caregivers or providers in a different way. And, and what does that look like for compensation and structure of the teacher workload? And what does that look like for how faculty are preparing individuals to go into the teaching profession. I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Hernandez. Uh, thoughts on the future? So one of the one of the things I'll throw out there uh, is that we we know across the country teachers are thinking about leaving the profession um, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, that this amount of pressure that's been on them is is clear, and some of that has been about their in difficulty with understanding technology, um, lack of resources around technology across districts, the uh, amount of training they've received in their educator preparation programs for online teaching. Um, you know, we have a lot of constraints in terms of what it means to complete 120 hours and what you can put into that time frame. So as Cynthia was saying, the, the best way we can address that is through these partnerships and putting these students out and making involvement in the schools, whether it's volunteer service, any level of engagement before they ever get to that clinical teaching residency model and making sure that the, that school is a part of their identity, giving them exposure to the real world so it's not a surprise uh, when they get out there that 
so if we have these students getting out there in their sophomore and their junior year, uh, they're doing tutoring, we're even looking at how we can get them into doing substitute teaching for the district uh, in that junior year. And then being that year long teacher resident, there's no surprises by the time they get out into the real world of teaching. They know exactly what they're getting into. And we are cultivating that passion, as, as Dr. Hernandez was saying. The heart that we all have here, we want that living brightly in the students that graduate. Um, and I think we're doing that. We, we had um, one of our students that just uh, graduated from the, the year long residency model, um, just finished his first year in Edgewood ISD. And he was named as the Texas State Teacher uh, of History of the Year. Um, and uh, we're, we're just so proud of that. And I he's a great student, but I also think that's a result of the exposure that he had to teaching along the way um, and the, the mentorship and the, the involvement he had. And I know he was a direct mentee of Dr. Matson, So um, a, lot of, a lot of kudos to her too for the work she did with him. So the last thing I'll add is, um, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to throw it to you. What's 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 the future there, Dr. Hernandez? I agree <laughs> that I, I think the future for us in, in the field is um, we've got to get the students exposed to what teaching is uh, earlier. Uh, I can tell you from the front lines, we are we are all having a problem right now with finding enough teachers for this fall. Uh, we have had people that have decided to just move on to other professions. Or you have folks who now are were much more aware because of the pandemic and being at home that they want more out of life. The way that we've been doing things was dissatisfactory to them. So I think those factors also have to be considered. When you, if you can cultivate, grow the next set of teachers that come teach around purpose, this is the place I want to be because I know that I'm walking into a district that has challenges. But that is my calling. That's where I want to go. And it will never be work. I do also think we have to change the way we teach and maybe um, give students credit for courses in earlier grades so they don't have to repeat what seems to them to be repetitive courses when they get to college. So they can focus on becoming educators at an earlier age. And if we have pipelines such as these, you know, these partnerships where they, they maybe had came into the recognizing Tamusa as a brand when they were sixth graders and then nine years later, they've graduated out and now they're ready to be certified teachers and stay in the district. And we can answer the question of, will you help me with my opportunity costs? I can't not, I cannot, I do not have an option not to work. My family needs help, help today. And we use whatever it is, federal funding, state funding to support that work so that they can have a little bit of money while they're building their dream. That is not only uh, building a pipeline, but it's also what, imagine what a great example that is to the next young man or woman sitting in the, sitting in the desk then and seeing, wow, there is a pathway. And I, know, and I happen to know such and such who is in my neighborhood. And so I think those are powerful examples that our students need, they need tangible examples. They don't need people that they will rarely interact with. They need to see somebody that came through the neighborhood and that is proud to speak to the fact that, hey, I, I grew up with my, very little. I'm out here, I'm, I'm doing this work because I'm doing it so that you'll come and replace me when I'm gone and the next person does it. So. I think the future is getting getting uh, future educators in earlier, clearing the pathway so they can finish and get into the classroom, but expose them to um, what the reality is to serve in a district like mine. It is one of the uh, it is one of the poorest districts in the state. Uh, and then, of course, beef up these other areas that we discovered our teachers. One, our teachers had a hard time teaching online, and even the kids who I, I was one of the people who said, "Well, they can use the phone. They should be able to." No, they didn't know how to use the platforms either. And so we discovered a lot. And so I think, quite frankly, going back to what was a normal, an accepted normal, uh, is not going to produce the teaching force we need. And I think that has implications for the city, the state, the nation. Uh, I think it's, it's powerful enough to say that it has implications for our democracy. And so I, I think these uh, kind of partnerships are going to be model partnerships uh, that hopefully will, will someone will take interest in and say, hey, look, it can be done. And look, Look, look at a district like Edgewood in the west side who I can see downtown. It might as well be 100 miles away because I don't, that's not my life. But these partnerships change families' trajectory. So that, that's why I'm so committed to them. You know, we've learned a lot too, Amy, in terms of the future. 
from what we've learned in the school districts that also impact our college students. And so we've revisited our college student digital literacy experience. We have a new program um, called LIFT. It stands for Literacy Information for Technology, where students, if they go through the class and the workshop, because we can't assume that they know, um, then uh, they will earn a laptop computer that's theirs, not a loaner, they get to keep it. It's that much of an investment in changing, changing the trajectory, as well as other, other lessons that have come to us from our partnerships with the districts that we're, we're putting into place here at the university for students that are here. The other piece I would add is, you know, the other vice presidents that work with me from the president's cabinet also understand the commitment to the Aspire network, and they too are looking for ways in which we engage the network differently. So we have a new promise program through our enrollment management division. It's an institutional scholarship that's dedicated to um, these particular districts that we're in, uh, at Edgewood in, in particular, the Achiever Promise Program. I've, I've challenged our internal teams that these schools are our kids too. Their families are our families too. So what does that look like for student activities and college activities where the families of and those middle schoolers can come to A&M San Antonio and participate in a student event or a student activity. What does that look like? So we're thinking about it differently. I think we're trying to challenge some of the other deans um, to think about the, the school districts in a different way. That's been a little bit of a heavier lift, but we're moving in that direction and uh, that there are opportunities. So it's not just, you know, Carl is, is a one person operation. He mentioned the 40 faculty, but we're really trying to bring everybody in to what we're doing in the Aspire network. Great, thank you for all those future thoughts. Um, we have about uh, nine minutes left. Uh, my last question is, and I'll just mention to the participants, if you do have a question, go ahead and type it in and we'll try and get it in here at the end. Uh, but my last question is um, thinking about our participants online today. Uh, if they're listening today and they're like, wow, so many great things and they just you know, need to know where to start, uh, what advice uh, can you give participants uh, online today uh, who might be thinking about re-envisioning their own partnership? Well, I think it's to think outside of uh, an MOU and a placement opportunity for your for your clinical teaching students. Um, that's the way we've always done things. Uh, we have to really think from a systems perspective and innovation and really think big, right? It's, a, it's easier to scale down than it is to think, how do we grow from here once we're in the middle of something? So, you know, the examining all the possibilities and putting out a, a map of where we want to be in five years and, and aligning our goals together and thinking about how we get there. Um, what that's done for us is to be able to have faculty members pursue grants, um, to write grants along with the staff of the district, um, to be able to um, look at implementing things like performance assessment for our teachers within the district, uh, coaching models, uh, we even developed a, a, an evidence-based curriculum for the middle school that we're, we're working with. And so our curriculum instruction faculty members were able to do that and to implement the evidence-based curriculum. So there, there's so many possibilities. And if we don't, if we put on our blinders and we just think about normal, typical school district university partnerships, we're missing out on so much. Uh, Dr. Hernandez or Dr. Matson, any advice for our participants? I think my advice to uh, any superintendent or school le leader that's out there, uh, first is have a very genuine conversation with your school board. Um, are we, what would we deem as a high quality school district now post pandemic? What did we learn through the pandemic? Is, uh, you know, we've proven as a school district the efficacy in terms of we were able to quickly stand up things like uh, feeding our families, uh, providing some level of support for students academically. We, we were able to do a lot of things, but are we still meeting that original mission about preparing our students for the future? And if the answer is not a, an unequivocal yes, then the time today is to really examine what do we do in the future? The future that yes, we don't quite, we now we know that the future we thought was gonna come is changing even much faster than what we anticipated. There is an opportunity now to change the way we've done things. Does this board and superintendent 
have the courage to go against accepted norms. You know, a lot of people, they hear things like in district charters. Oh, we don't talk about charters. We don't even, don't even come talk to us. That's just like the devil word. Um, you, you've got to, you, that's, that to me, that's an excuse. It's an easy way out, quite frankly. I think what it does is that it causes people to see it as more work. And if we're really about helping scholars, then we've got, we've got to accept that that is the work that is required of us. And then hopefully be able to have a very honest conversation with the people in the district and get them to see the bigger picture and be a, be a master at explaining why we're doing what we're doing. Take it back to purpose, take it back to heart. And so I think that would be my initial advice to uh, any other administrator or superintendent that's out there. Have the conversation with your board, align yourself with other leaders in the city or town or wherever you are who are future and fast forward thinking thinkers. In our case, it was Dr. Madsen, uh, the, the other folks that are out there, align yourself with individuals that wanna do uh, greater things for your community and think collective impact. Stop thinking about just my slice of the pie. Think of all of us, even the children that exist outside of your boundaries. They, you have an obligation to them too. And so I think that is, that is what I, my advice would be to a superintendent sitting out there. And I think for the people from the universities to really listen, uh, understand uh, what the needs are and how you can corral and shepherd all of your resources. Even if you have to start small um, in, in terms, I mean, Carl said, think big and said, think big. And I, I agree with all of those things. But if you're a faculty member, you may have to start with your own course or your own research or your own students. And how are you approaching um, the problems that need to be solved to build that business case uh, to push up to the dean and push up to the provost and, and the university president to make that connection and that alignment? Uh, the, but it, it is, there's a lot of levers that need to be pulled. This is not easy work. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And uh, I commend Carl and Ed but for their vision to, to, to join in. And while we're giving you all the best, it's not always perfect, but we remain committed and we're move, move, pulling it through. I, want, I wanted to add one more thing to what I was saying. Um, Ed talked about, you know, his story uh, growing up. I, I think that, you know, Cynthia and my story are similar. Uh, we're first generations uh, college students. I grew up in poverty. Uh, my mom, if you understand rank of professors, when uh, um, I was an assistant professor, my mom worked in a convenience store and she was telling people that I was a professor's assistant. Um, she had no clue what I did even to the day she, the day she died. Um, but what I did when um, I went and talked to Ed's board was to tell my story, you know, and to talk about it from a heart standpoint, you have to take a risk and be open and be willing to form a relationship and not just be a salesman and go in and try to sell a school board on an opportunity. That doesn't, that doesn't make a, com a, a community relationship. So, you know, I talked about what it was like to grow up. I talked about my, uh, for me, the, I had a teacher that took off time from school to take me on college visits because my mom and my dad had, couldn't afford to take a day off and couldn't, uh, didn't have, they had one car that they shared. And so for me, giving back to teachers and to be committed to teachers is a part of who I am. And I shared that with the board. And I think those kind of open conversations make a difference. Well said. Yes, very well said. Thank you all so much. So inspirational, mucho corazón um, out there in the field. And uh, we are so happy to uh, be able to bring you all together so that people can hear all of these great things going on. We only have about two minutes left. So I'm just going to thank the panelists. I'm gonna thank the participants who are joining us today. And I'm gonna hand it off to, to Aubrey briefly, uh, just to uh, wrap it up with a, a few tidbits of information. Thank you all again so much. And thank you to, to Amy for moderating. You did a great job. Um, so I just want to let everybody know the events that we have coming up in the spring before you go. Does everybody see my slide with the fall and spring events? Wonderful. Um, so we have a series on innovative pedagogies coming up in the spring. Uh, this is just a little bit of a preview of the panelists that we'll have in our upcoming series. And this will be up on our website in August. So uh, please check it out and we'll be sending out communications as well. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We'll send out the recording of this later.